Hey everybody, I just finished reading an amazing book called Stein on Writing, and today, instead of writing, I'm gonna share with you five insanely valuable takeaways from that book. If you're like me, you are always on the hunt for amazing books that are just going to improve the craft of writing instead of just getting advice from, you know, your friends who are great, but sometimes their advice is less so. I'm looking at you, Thomas. What was that? I'm never getting back that bike. So when I was searching for best books on writing, Stein on Writing came up uh, pretty near the top of most of the lists that I could find. Uh, so I got a copy myself, and uh, let me tell you, I think it's appropriately placed on those lists. So who was Sol Stein? He actually died very recently, in September 2019, which is only a couple of months ago. I think that was a major loss to the literary world. He was a novelist, a playwright, an editor, a publisher. To give you a little bit of a background, he studied under Thornton Wilder for a while, the guy who wrote Our Town, as well as a lot of other famous plays. He worked alongside Tennessee Williams, and he helped publish authors like George Orwell. In the 70s, he went on to start his own publishing house called Stein and Day. They eventually had to close their doors, file for bankruptcy, but he somehow even managed to turn that into a literary success because he wrote a book about it for entrepreneurs and for publishers. And that book got a major nod from the New York Times, as well as recognition from a bunch of different organizations. So, in defeat, victory. Well done, soul. So I think his book is definitely worth a purchase if you're serious about the craft of writing. But if you want the really, really abbreviated version, or if you need some more persuading to go pick up a copy, here are my five major takeaways that I got from reading the book. Number one, he talks a lot about the difference between literary and commercial fiction. I should start by saying that it's not exactly a binary thing. It's probably more of a spectrum in Solstein's eyes. But literary fiction is the type of fiction that lasts a long time and doesn't take shortcuts to get quick emotional reactions. Um, one of my favorite quotes from the book is he says, you often refer to commercial fiction as a good read and literary fiction as like a good book. And I am saying fiction, but it extends to nonfiction as well. There are some kind of popcorn-y type of nonfiction books I think that he would refer to as commercial, and then some, some fabulous nonfiction books that he would refer to as literary. It becomes very obvious which side of the spectrum he prefers. Spoiler alert, it's literary. But he also talks about ways to avoid being a commercial writer. One of the biggest things he says differentiates the two is that commercial writers aren't quite as careful with their wording and with the visuals that they paint. They will get sloppy with metaphors and similes and stuff like that. Now, this was really important for me to hear because I think all writers would like to consider themselves as literary writers and not just, you know, pounding out things to, that we hope are going to be bestsellers and then gone in a couple of years. So he's got a lot of tips about how to become a literary writer and to create lasting impressions on readers in ways that will withstand the test of time. That brings me to point number two, and that is cliches. Going back to the literary versus commercial writer distinction, he says that commercial writers will opt and kind of reach for cliches, while literary writers are always trying to push the envelope. Cliches come in a lot of forms. Some are very dramatic and some are just like less dramatic. <laughs> I should have used a cliche there. Ah, oh, think, can you think? Some are a dime a dozen. A dime a dozen. I haven't seen a dime in like months. But he says, avoid cliches like the plague. If you want to use a cliche, flag it and see if you can create a new description for the term. This was a like such a wonderful thought that I really clung to, and I hope I could challenge myself in my own writing. Try to describe things in ways that haven't been used before. If you're gonna describe a raincoat, for example, don't just go with the usual description of a rain, and now what is the usual description of a raincoat, you ask? Yellow, plastic, shiny, or got wet and dried quickly. He would push you to say it was the type of raincoat that a father would leave a son. Now suddenly you're like, what kind of raincoat is that? You use those kind of sticky particularities in order to create non-cliches. The anti-cliche. Anti-cliche? Oui. Très bien. Merci. Next, he breaks down all of writing into three major categories. So for number three, let's talk about his three major categories. He has description, narrative summary, and immediate scene. Basically, go easy on description, uh, narrative scene, which he describes as basically action that happens 
off stage, which is his playwright background coming into play here. You see it all the time in books. It's not exactly the scene that's happening, but it's kind of this in-between. It happens a lot um, that describes movement. Let me briefly sum up how they travel. He calls that narrative summary, where you, you just summarize the in-betweens between the scenes. And then immediate scene is what he refers to as the visual scene that's happening before the reader's eyes. I talk to my students about this when they're writing comedy, and I say, try to do in media res, which is kind of in the middle of the action. And I think it's something similar, where you don't want to talk about stuff that's not happening right in front of you or directly on stage. You want to bring the conflict, you want to bring the action right there. Number four, he spends a good portion of the book talking about characterization. For him, literary writers create characters that he just can't seem to stop reading about. Or what he hoped for as an editor, was simply to fall so in love with the character that he couldn't bear to leave the manuscript in his desk overnight. It's not such a lovely, it's just such a lovely thing, lovely visual. See, that's not a cliche. <laughs> What's a cliche? Editors like good first pages and literary voice cliche. What does he say? He doesn't want to leave the manuscript in his desk overnight. It's just beautiful. Thank you, soul. If you're uh, somewhere in heaven watching YouTube, you shouldn't be watching YouTube. Go do something else, you're in heaven. I bet they've got soda pop on tap, chocolate chip cookies, as many as you want. Every dog you've ever loved just hanging out by your feet. Heaven sounds great. So he spends a lot of time talking about characterization uh, and he brings up this idea of markers. Now markers are specific kind of small details that help you bring greater weight to a character in a very economical way. One example, are fingernails. Fingernails could be a great marker for a character because if a character has dirty fingernails habitually, it says a lot about the lifestyle of that person. Teeth are another one, a way of speaking. If you have a character that uses a lot of profanity, that's gonna say an awful lot about that character. So he goes into depth about these markers and how these markers can help flesh out characters. He suggests just trying to find a few of these details and letting those do the work in the reader's mind. And finally, number five, he has a system of revising that's just phenomenal. And it's all centered around this idea of an author going cold on their manuscript, which is something I think if you are someone who's written a book or even a short story or any type of work, that like end the time you've read that, you are like, get me out of here because I am sick of reading this book. So instead he creates a framework of issues to look at and a correct order for looking at them so that you can solve the bigger problems before you dive into a general read through of your manuscript to kind of take care of the nitty gritty and the fine print type of stuff. It has a lot to do with looking at your characters, making sure your characters have the right drive, looking at the villain, making sure the villain's an adequate response to your protagonist and, and stuff like that. I'm not gonna spoil it all, one, because uh, it actually goes into some pretty significant detail, um, and two, because uh, you should buy the book. It really is, it was just a fabulous read. If you're anything like me, it'll be completely marked up by the time you're done. I'm gonna get back to writing my manuscript. All this talk of writing is just so motivating. Motivating! If you like the video, go ahead and leave some comments. If you've read Stein on Writing or Growing Your Novel by Soul Stein as well, you can drop some comments below. I'd love to chat with you there. And if you like the video, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss stuff in the future. I'm Kenny Baldwin. Thanks again for watching Instead of Writing. <laughs>